I think it's fantastic. I think the more people are cross-pollinated between different musical styles, it, it not only has musical implications, but it has cultural ones as well. Over the last couple of decades, a fair amount of music genres have been subjected to needless hate and strangely bad reputations. While, to be fair, many of these do have their faults, there are a fair amount of genres that are unfairly beaten into the ground. And I can think of no better example than the once radio-dominating sound of new metal, a genre that defined the late 90s in all of its edgy, cheesy glory. And while the new metal scene is no stranger to cash cow industry plants and bland copy-paste artists, it's also one that's bred countless amounts of innovations that are still heard in music today. The genre itself has been the unfairly beaten dead horse of quote-unquote bad music for quite a long time. We've all seen the hit piece articles and videos denouncing the genre as a whole. Hello guys, today we will talk about the abomination of music, new metal. It's the worst style of music ever and everyone who likes it is a complete retard. The hate train has been so thoroughly played out by now that even some of the genre defining acts have gone out of their way to rebrand themselves as alternative metal. But let's just take a step back and ask ourselves honestly here, is new metal really that bad? Or is it actually kind of good? In recent years, the stigma has been slowly beginning to fade, with more and more bands across all of heavy music and even hip-hop taking some major influence from the genre. And I'm here to say once and for all, new metal was never bad, and honestly it was kind of amazing. So let's dive into the trenches and talk about new metal. What the deciders have decided you must do. They use force to make you do what the deciders have decided you must do. New metal as a genre is often credited as being started by the band Korn. While I do agree that they were one of the first and biggest to do the sound, new metal's roots are actually a lot more interesting than just one band from a shithole like Bakersfield. If we were actually going to dig up the roots of the genre, they're deep-seated in quite a few different sounds and underground scenes. And this is no real surprise given how diverse the genre sound can actually be. Despite what clickbait farms like Metal Sucks might have you believe, the genre is a lot more than just tacky rap metal. That rock band with the DJ? Yeah! That's us, motherfucker. Somebody tell this band what year it is. Its origins can actually be found in places like alternative rock, grunge, industrial, hip-hop, groove metal, and even funk. Just think about the bands most associated with the sound. Korn, Linkin Park, Deftones, Limp Bizkit, Slipknot, Orgy, System of a Down. Aside from maybe two of those bands, could you really stick most of them in the rap metal box? I didn't think so. Oh, and before some fat redditor cries in the comments about System of a Down and Deftones not being new metal, they've been deeply associated with and even seen as stars of the genre long before people started lumping them in with the term alternative metal. Now, if I were to actually point to the bands I think paved the way for new metal, it would be Rage Against the Machine, Ministry, Suicidal Tendencies, and anything involving Mike Patton. All of these bands were genre-bending artists in their own right, with Rage Against the Machine showing just how well rock and hip-hop go together, Ministry taking synth-pop, metal, and industrial and creating a sound wholly unique to them, and Suicidal Tendencies being THE crossover thrash band. The 
the underground and at times even mainstream level success of these artists created an interesting moment in music during the late 80s and early 90s, with many artists now finding more and more favor with audiences when experimenting with sounds previously thought to not go together. This all created a perfect storm for a new generation of artists to take all these building blocks and create a more cohesive sound all on its own. But before I get ahead of myself, I think it's important to talk about the previously mentioned Mike Patton. Mike Patton is a name I'm sure most of you have heard of at some point. Not only for his many great bands, but also for his work in voice acting, video games, and film composition. The Chili Pepper Slaying Renaissance Man can almost single-handedly be credited as the progenitor of new metal. Whether that's a crown he wants or not is neither here nor there. But his two most well-known projects, Mr. Bungle and Faith No More, served as the biggest inspirations to the genre. Faith No More themselves are a band with a lot of history pre-Mike Patton, though with his entrance to the band, he brought a much more eclectic and experimental touch to their sound. bringing out much more of the funk and hip-hop elements the band had buried within themselves. I mean, we've all heard Epic by now. It's been a staple of rock radio since before most of us were born. Though I think the more influential of Patton's projects would be the infamous Mr. Bungle. Cited as an influence by many, but most importantly by Korn as one of their key influences. Another one of our uh, inspirations were a band called Mr. Bungle. Yeah, right? And they were just doing that. You know, what's a, I don't even know, some of those songs are... What the hell is that? The band's unorthodox take on rock and metal with hints of funk and opera was absolutely massive for the time, but most importantly for new metal, it was the band's take on guitar playing, with heavy uses of dissident and sometimes outright broken chords to assault the listener. You can hear this kind of thing all over new metal, and Mr. Bunkle is to thank for that. But with all that being said, I think it's time we look at the genre's real beginnings. For better or worse, Rage Against the Machine seems to have planted the seeds for the genre that sprung up known as new metal. My apologies. Once the early 90s came around, the world of music, especially rock and metal, would see a nearly overnight rejuvenation and shift never seen before or since. With the thriving underground scene hosting many innovative and interesting takes on genres, it was inevitable that it would eventually hit the mainstream. And on September 10th, 1991, that time had come. This overplayed piece of radio rock changed the world of music overnight. Smells Like Teen Spirit wasn't just an MTV hit, Nirvana had unintentionally ruined the careers of almost every 80s cock rock band and brought a new standard to what mainstream rock should sound like. Grunge took the world by storm, seeing the likes of Nirvana, Smashing Pumpkins, Alice in Chains, and Soundgarden to the center stage of the world of music. And only a year later, Nine Snails would do the same thing with their groundbreaking EP, Broken. This also ushered in a new wave of artists like Marilyn Manson and Prick, while bringing an even bigger spotlight to the 80s industrial bands that paved their path. 
What does any of this have to do with new metal? Simple. Pop-focused radio rock anthems about drinking whiskey and banging underage groupies were out of fashion, and noisy, intense songs about politics, abuse, and trauma were in. The pretty boy heartthrobs who once dominated the industry were no longer viewed as demigods. The tortured artist and degenerating addict, they were the new icons. And it was this very same energy that came to metal music. As stated before, the underground metal scene was beginning to evolve in much the same way rock had, with heavier and more intense bands like Pantera, Machine Head, and Tool seeing some key success in the genre. Now, what would happen if we took just about every sound we've talked about today and threw it all into a blender? Well, you get this. Are you ready? What Nirvana did for rock, Korn did for metal. When Blind came out, it just made everything that came before it feel extremely dated. There was something pure and fresh about the tortured and strange sound the band was playing with, combining hip-hop grooves, growling screams, low-tuned guitars, and melodic choruses. It all just worked, and overnight a new wave of bands creating sounds adjacent to Korn would pop up, and because of just how different the band's image and sound were, they ended up performing alongside metal, rock, and punk bands alike, garnering themselves a diverse and interesting fan base, finally becoming the centerpiece of an entirely new scene that had been brewing in the underground for nearly a decade. Once Korn hit the scene and became the new heroes of underground metal, a phenomenon I like to call the Adidas wave hit the music industry like a sack of bricks. Bands taking similar approaches to metal music started popping up left, right, and center, with Deftones, Limp Bizkit, and P.O.D. coming out of the woodwork. As the 90s went on, more and more bands taking different influences and genres into the mix also came to prominence, such as Orgy with their heavy synth-pop influence, and Coal Chamber with Groove Metal. Now, to get into all this in more detail, it wasn't as instant as grunge. Korn and Deftones were the two biggest bands during the early days of new metal, and both would see a fair amount of success upon their debut records, but wouldn't find that arena rock niche until their second and third records respectively. For Korn, their first two albums were harsh, dark, and very much inspired by the popular grunge sound of the time. There was an alluring nature to the depravity and gloom that the band presented with their imagery and lyrics, and they would even become notorious for their trauma anthems like Daddy and Kill You, where Jonathan Davis would musically vomit his abusive past for all to hear. And, you know, I'm sure this little breakdown had just a little bit of influence on metalcore. Though, what would transform the band from underground legends to MTV heroes was their beloved third record, Follow the Leader. Follow the Leader was massive. It took the sound the band was famous for and cleaned it up to be much more accessible and polished, as well as turned up the hip-hop influence even higher, bringing on guests like Ice Cube, Trey Henderson, and even a young Fred Durst before Limp Bizkit was really put on the map. Follow the Leader and its follow-up issues are probably Korn's best records, not only because they were massive, but being the most definitive and polished takes on the classic new metal sound. Now, as for Deftones, 
their debut was much less dark and instead landed in a more neutral place. With the sound they started with being much more hip hop influenced, with Chino loosely rapping over some of the tracks. and using his trademark vocal style on others. Though the band would quickly change into something far different with their next two releases, taking the building blocks in their debut and bringing in a much stronger showgaze and punk influence with their second record, Around the Fur, skyrocketing the band to the mainstream. It was with this less dissident and edgy and more melodic and dreamy sound that would eventually lead the band to be held in a different regard than most other bands associated with new metal, eventually leading to Deftones being branded as alternative metal, once their former genre became far too hated and toxic to be associated with. You know, because new metal bands all have to be super tryhard and can't be good, right? Okay, along the passage, down the stairs, into the kitchen, open the cupboard, and yeah! Where the classic new metal iteration of Deftones would hit their peak would be with their third record, White Pony, a legendary and amazing album that much like Follow the Leader brought the genre to near perfection. Atmosphere, musicianship, vocals, lyrics, everything about White Pony was light years ahead of almost everything else at the time, especially within new metal, which, albeit is a bit juvenile of a genre. <laughs> I do plan to explore this record in far greater detail in another video, but needless to say, if you're at all into heavy music, White Pony is required listening. With the success of Deftones and Korn in the mid to late 90s, they had their fair share of small imitators, but more importantly, bigger bands would start to emulate and adopt the new metal sound. Bands like Sepultura and Machine Head began incorporating lower tunings and funk and hip hop elements to keep up with the times. As the 90s began to come to a close, we saw new metal split off into some pretty diverse subgenres. You had the more classic sound of the previously mentioned bands, but also the rap metal variant of the genre, one that became extremely popular with Limp Bizkit and Linkin Park eclipsing almost every other band from the genre at the time, with Limp Bizkit starting off in a more traditional territory for the sound. It was only with their later records that they evolved into the frat boy metal we've all come to love and hate today. Other bands of this nature would be the previously mentioned P.O.D., who's often conflated as the Christian Limp Bizkit. as well as bands like Papa Roach and Head P.E. And while this style of the genre become the most well-known and, uh, well, despised, other takes on the sound would be accepted with much more enthusiasm, like the heavier, more aggressive variants of Mudvayne, and most importantly, Slipknot. Don't give a shit, don't have a choice, 
while it's easy to look at the gimmicky nature of these bands with their spirit Halloween aesthetic, many would just become a flash in the pan with huge overnight success, but oftentimes short-lived careers. Slipknot is the obvious outlier here, becoming bigger than new metal itself and gaining a rabid following that would prop the band up as one of the biggest metal bands of all time. However, one of the more forgotten takes on new metal was the industrial side of the genre. Industrial was the other dark and dissident genre that dominated the late 90s, so crossover was almost inevitable. And from this collaboration of sounds came bands like Dope. Orgy. And most famously, Static X. Now, there were plenty of bands that covered this sound, but outside of a handful of artists, they were all mostly forgettable. But in the case of bands like Orgy and Static X, they both did things that would set them apart from the rest of the new metal pack. Orgy is one of the most criminally underrated bands of the genre, cursed by the fact that they came out during the last dying breaths of the genre's heyday. But their upbeat and synth-pop inspired take on the genre was something very special, dropping much of the callous edginess of the genre in favor of a fun and catchy song structure. All this being wrapped in a cheesy cyberpunk aesthetic. As for Static X, well, they took the opposite approach. The band was relentlessly heavy for the time, relying on fast-paced drum loops and syncopated guitar parts, topped with Wayne Static's trademark vocals. And with all this, the band would see some major success right out the gate, maintaining relatively high popularity until the late 2000s when the band would dissolve and Wayne would sadly delve deeper into his addiction, tragically overdosing in 2014. While I'm skipping over a vast amount of bands, these are just a few of the ones I thought were the most important to talk about from Nu Metal's massive wave of popularity. But like anything that comes to rise, it inevitably flew too close to the sun. I detested Nu Metal. Um, I thought it, it, it kind of set us back to the Stone Age as far as rock's concerned. Nu Metal's decline was one of the quickest I have ever seen in the music industry. While most phenomena tend to die out with a whimper and slowly fade away, Nu Metal did the opposite. During its height of popularity during the turn of the century, the genre was quickly left in the dust. While we still saw groundbreaking and huge records like Linkin Park's Hybrid Theory see release, other flavors of rock and metal began to pop up and quickly replace new metal. All of this is down to two key factors, at least in my opinion, and those would be oversaturation and media assassination. Like anything that gets big, the market will inevitably get oversaturated with watered-down knockoff bands doing little more than playing on the cliches of the genre, and with the music media machine pumping out article after article attacking the genre and denouncing its fan base, many bands formerly associated with the genre would begin to brand themselves under different genres themselves and separate their names from new metal itself. Most famously, I could point to Deftones, as I already have a few times now, or a band like System of a Down, who would also do the same thing in later years. Despite how popular many of the bands were, New Metal was never cool. It had always been met with scorn and hatred by music journos, mainstream media, and popular artists alike. Everyone was itching to take pot shots, and after a while, it led to the consensus that New Metal was terrible and nothing good ever came from it. And once social media came around, this sentiment was continually pushed by many of the tastemakers of the time. Also, Cheesy songs like Bring Me to Life didn't do any favors for the scene at large. 
Another contributing factor was the newfound popularity at the time of emo, post hardcore and meteoric rise of metalcore. The Warp Tour scene itself would quickly become the new status quo of alternative culture, and eventually, a very similar scapegoat for many of new metal's old critics. And with that, as quickly as it came, it went. A hated memory of the past, regardless of the many innovations that it gave us. Yeah, mix it with tapping and then it kind of sounds bigger. Are you influenced by Ryan Martin? Yeah, it's, it's obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This Brbrdang thing is now a meme. This guy definitely stepped over all limits which were before him and managed to implement a number of new techniques and not only just pure techniques but also ways musically playing some scales and notes yeah which uh, are not have not had not been used before here. now over the years the stink around new metal has slowly begun to fade away with many of the key bands seeing a resurgence of popularity and success achieving legacy status but also many different artists have become taking major influence from it as well and not just in heavy music either Across the musical spectrum, people like Ghost Mane or bands like Vain FM, Crossfaith, Sworn In, May She Smile, Spite, they've all cited new metal as a massive influence and you can hear it directly in the music that they make. And on top of this, many of the old voices who decry the genre no longer are relevant and a younger generation is now discovering these bands without any of the bias. And this has all led to the genre finally being given the credit it deserves and being viewed for what it actually was. Now, was new metal cheesy, try hard, and outright terrible at times? Oh fuck yeah, it was. But I mean, what genre hasn't been like that? In reality, new metal was hated and derided because it came out during a time when experimentation wasn't viewed with as much enthusiasm as it is now and many people took themselves far too seriously to get behind the more goofy and strange elements of the sound and aesthetic. Something else I think that really set new metal apart was it was never really part of any specific subculture or scene. It was this weird amalgamation of many different things coming together. So your average mainstream audience or pretentious and insulated subculture or subgroup couldn't really get into it. And due to a mixture of classism and outright pride, I think many people just hated it for appealing to an often forgotten and neglected group of people who are more eclectic in their tastes. The people who are often looked at as weird outcasts who didn't really fit into the more traditional subcultures. But with all that being said, New Metal was pretty damn good and if you haven't delved into it before, there are some gems buried in it. You might have to dig for them, but it's well worth the effort. Subscribe. Support me on Patreon, follow me on Twitter, I'll see you in the next video. It's me, Madison Ray. Play up your pathetic little baby pitties.